Hi everybody and thank you for joining me in this new video presentation regarding catheter ablation of atrial tachycardia after previous ablation of atrial fibrillation. I hope you will enjoy this video and join me in my future video presentations. The patient is a 74-year-old man who was admitted for catheter ablation to our center because of frequent atrial tachycardia after previous ablation of atrial fibrillation. Analyzing the P-wave morphology is the first step in the mapping of atrial tachycardia. Therefore, we need a good quality ECG. And for the good quality ECG, we need a perfect filter setting. High pass filter to 0.05 Hz and low pass filter to 100 Hz. We have to remember in teenagers and adolescents, we have to put the low pass filter to 150 Hz. Putting high pass filter to 0.1 Hz may improve the ECG quality, but we have to remember it creates patterns like Brugada syndrome and ST elevation in our ECG. We have to avoid using notch filter in ECG. The gain should be set to 0.2 millivolt per centimeter. In this way, we can analyze the P-wave morphology and polarity better. And last but not least, good electrode skin connection, especially the right leg is very important to have a very good ECG quality. After having the ECG, the intracardiac signals are very important. The noise in our EP lab should be below 0.01 millivolt, and also all the notch and adaptive filters should be avoided, especially in mapping and ablation of atrial tachycardia. High pass and low pass filter for bipolar signal should be set to 30 and 250 respectively. And we have to remember that if we lower the low pass filter to below 250, we will lose some signals like pulmonary vein potentials, his Purkinje system potentials, and also low amplitude fragmented potentials in the scar area. The optimal signal amplification on ablation catheter is 40 to 80 millimeters per one millivolt. We have to remember that the value of surface ECG is decreased after extensive atrial ablation because the magnitude and direction of atrial activation is tremendously affected. For example, up to 60% of typical atrial flutters after extensive AF ablation has no typical ECG presentation. However, two features in ECG remain relatively unaffected. Morphology of the P wave in lead V1 and precordial transition of the P waves. The incidence of atrial tachycardia after previous AF ablation can be as high as 40 to 60 percent. We can use a simple three-step approach for mapping and ablation of these tachycardias. In step one, we look for cycle length regularity. If we have a regular cycle length, first we have to confirm or exclude the diagnosis of macular entrant atrial tachycardia and do the ablation accordingly. If we have a cycle length irregularity more than 15% or in case of regular tachycardia, if we exclude the macular entrant tachycardia at the third step, we have to locate the focal activity and focal atrial tachycardia, which can be either true focal or micro entrant atrial tachycardia. Before looking at the ECG of our patient, we have to remember that the first important step is to differentiate right atrial from left atrial tachycardia. And to do that, we can use the P-wave morphology in surface ECG, CS activation pattern analysis, and finally activation and entrainment mapping. We have to remember if we have a proximal to distal CS activation, still 73% of these tachycardias are left atrial and 23% are right atrial tachycardias. Here is the ECG of our patient. When we look at the P-wave morphology in V1 to V6, we see a positive component. So we may think that there is a positive concordance and therefore we have a left atrial tachycardia. But looking closer, we can see that especially in the lateral precordial lead, we have an initial negative P-wave component, which confirmed the diagnosis of right atrial tachycardia. Looking at the limb leads, especially 2-3 AVF, we see the typical pattern for a typical atrial flutter, isthmus-dependent typical atrial flutter. So the next step would be activation and entrainment mapping in the right atrium. 
Here we see the activation mapping using coherent mapping, which showed a isthmus-dependent counterclockwise peritoricuspidal atrial tachycardia, and the ablation of covotricuspid isthmus successfully terminated the tachycardia. I hope you enjoyed this short video presentation and I would like to invite you to join me in my future video presentations.